Let's get into the Word of God. We're talking about the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. And in order to do that, I want to go to Acts chapter 15. We Last time we were talking from Acts chapter 14. So I believe it's good to go on and continue through the book of Acts and show some of the things that were involved in the Holy Spirit's operation in directing and guiding the church. Amen? So let's go to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, these men said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. They were making circumcision a requirement for salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is not scriptural. We know that from what Paul said in his writings. But remember, Paul at this point had written those writings. So the early church was kind of struggling with the direction they were taking here. Uh, but the church in Jerusalem, headed up by the pastor, James, you know, who is literally the half-brother of Jesus, they heard what was happening in Judea, and so this is what happened in verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and the apostles and elders about this question. They wanted to go to Jerusalem and talk to James, talk to the church hierarchy, you might say, about this issue. Verse 3, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenasi and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Most of the uh, Jewish Christian believers at that time received the news that the Gentiles had been born again in what we call the Gentile Pentecost uh, with great joy. And that's exciting. Verse 4, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there arose a certain of the sect of the Pharisees which had believed, these are Pharisees, that had believed in the Lord, that it was needful to circumcise them, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, <clears throat> that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. In other words, recounting what happened at what we call the Gentile Pentecost in Cornelius' house. Uh, and ch Acts chapter 15, verse 8, And God, which knoweth their hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, not by works, not by actions, not by circumcision, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. In other words, you might say, as Brother Hagin has said before, the proof of the pud is in the eating. <laughs> God is confirming the word with signs following. So the word that they're preaching must be the direction the Holy Spirit has taken the church. Now, this is a principle that we can see that we need to see and bear in mind. The Word of God will always confirm the direction that you are led supernaturally. Listen to this closely. If it is not confirmed by the Word and by God attesting to that Word then you need to seriously think about what you've been teaching. Amen? Signs and wonders ought to follow the Word. Amen? Supernatural confirmation ought to follow Word being preached. Then all the multitude kept silence, gave audience to Barnabas and to Paul. 
Notice this team of Barnabas and Paul. That's going to come up here shortly. Declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they held their peace, James, remember James is the pastor of the church. James is the Lord, Jesus' half-brother. James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. Notice, he quotes scripture. As it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build up again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them. In other words, my judgment on this is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they do these certain things. This is what they wanted to be consistent among the brethren at this time. That they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication, in other words, sex outside of marriage, and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city uh, them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this matter, make it an official. The apostles and elders and brethren said, Greeting unto the brethren which are at the, uh, of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, forasmuch as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. See, this didn't come from the church in Jerusalem and from James, the pastor of that church. It seemed good to, unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are heroes of the faith. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And then they list the three things that they were concerned about. That you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. From which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare ye well. And they closed off the letter that they sent to them. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch and went and had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, the letter, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. In other words, all the Christians, all those Gentiles that had been born again, heard that this was the judgment from Jerusalem. And verse 32, And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Amen. So supernaturally, it was confirmed what that judgment was. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barsabbas, or excuse me, Paul also and Barnabas, sorry, uh, continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, and many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of God and see how they do. Now, what Paul is proposing here is yet another missionary journey, but one where he will go and confirm the people that they'd already preached to, that he and, and uh, Barnabas had already won to the Lord, churches that had been established, pastors that had been set up in those churches, and they wanted to see how they're doing. Make sure the churches are doing well. These are apostles of the Lord that have go are going out as missionaries to these churches. Verse 37, And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. John Mark. 
Now, what we find out from the Word of God is that uh, John Mark was actually Barnabas's sister's son. That's shown in Colossians 4.10. He's identified as his sister's son or his nephew. Now, he had a soft spot, you might say, for John Mark. John Mark was a young man. He was not a seasoned minister of the gospel. But he had gone along on missionary journeys, at least one with them before. And uh, Acts 12, 25 states that, that he went with Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey. However, notice what happens here. When Paul thought not good, this is verse 38, but Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. In other words, when they went on a missionary journey before, they had taken him with them before, but when they departed to Pamphylia, John Mark didn't go with them. He stayed back. Now, you know, I don't know why he stayed back. Uh, he obviously was not, he was young. He's obviously not disciplined. He obviously was not dedicated to the work of the Lord at this point in time as a young man. And Paul basically said, you know, Barnabas, I just don't think we can count on him in so many words. You see what I'm saying? And so Paul was saying, John Mark, he's not going to help us on this journey. He backed out on the Pamphylia journey, on the Pamphylia trip. He went not with us to the work. Now again, whatever his reasoning was, I don't know. But, you know, I kind of like to think of this just in my mind's eye. I like to think of him as maybe a millennial. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, this is too hard. I don't want to do this. And just slacked off. And Paul just was not excited about that. Now, he had nothing personally against John Mark in and of himself, so to speak. But he didn't like the fact that he wasn't consistent. And he knew that they needed to take people with them that were solid, all right? And so he says, I, I just don't think this is a good idea. Paul thought it not good. I like the way it says that, the King James. Who departed with them from Pamphylia, went not with them to the work, and the contention was so sharp between them, between Paul and Barnabas. The contention. I want you to think about that, contention. They had a contention over this matter. Now, what is contention? Well, <laughs> they split up over it. It was a contention. It was confusion. And what do we do about what the Word of God says? God is not the author of confusion or strife. You can find that in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, that God is not the author of confusion. And James 3, 16 talks about that God is not the author of strife or contention. So this was not of God, this separation of this ministry team. And it was caused by Barnabas being determined in and of himself that John Mark should go with them. Now, I think it was because he was his nephew. And I'm sure he had a soft spot in his heart toward him. Uh, toward him. And, uh, you know, very often family relationships can get in the way of following the Spirit of God. I tend to believe, this is just me, you know, this rest of us between you and the Lord, but just me. I tend to think there's biblical evidence here that Paul was in the right in this regard and that John Mark needed some more additional seasoning and training that he wasn't ready for this responsibility, and Paul knew he couldn't count on him. And he's asking Barnabas to overlook his family relationship and be more concerned about the needs of the ministry. Okay? And uh, Proverbs 13.10 is a very interesting verse of Scripture. In the King James it says, Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Only by pride 
cometh contention. Now, obviously, Barnabas was proud of his nephew, thought well of him. But I like what I heard Keith Moore say. He said, if family is put first, then God is not. I want you to think about that. If family and family relationships are put first, then God is not put first. I think that's a wise statement. And we see here that this contention that occurred, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Now, Paul and Barnabas could have sat down, maybe even with John Mark, and had a discussion over this. But the contention got so strong, they actually split up over it. Now, in the easy-to-read version in Proverbs 13.10, it reads this way. Pride causes arguments, but those who listen to others are wise. I think it would have been wiser for Barnabas to sit down and put his feelings aside and his family relationship aside and listen to what Paul had to say about John Mark needing more seasoning, because I believe that was the problem from Paul's perspective, that he couldn't count on him. Now, here's the thing. Barnabas is a good man. Barnabas is not a novice. He is a seasoned man of God. But he was putting his family first in this instance. We know he was a good man because he brought Paul before the uh, church in Jerusalem after he was born again, Paul being born again, and basically vouched for him. The church at Jerusalem was not going to receive Paul because they'd heard what he had done to the church prior to him being born again. But Barnabas vouched for him and said, Hey, Paul's all right. He's been born again. He's okay. Now, Acts 9, 26 makes this clear. Let's read that. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. They thought he was deceiving them. Verse 27, But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he would preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas was a good man. Barnabas was a solid guy. And he and Paul became friends and became ministry partners together. They ministered together as a team. But this contention over John Mark occurred. Now, the rest of the narrative of the book Acts continues to follow Paul and Silas on their journey, not Barnabas and John Mark on their journey. So when they split up, the book of Acts follows Paul. Amen. So I tend to believe there's biblical evidence that Paul was correct about his hesitation of having John Mark come. Now, they must have later reconciled. They must have later come together. Because Paul says of this same guy, John Mark, on in uh, verse, uh, I'll read this out of uh, 2 Timothy 4.11, out of the King James, Paul says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he, John Mark, is profitable to me for the ministry. So at some point in this later time, the years had passed, John Mark had grown up some, he'd gotten more responsible, he'd gotten seasoned, he and Barnabas had gone on journeys themselves, if necessary, Barnabas had corrected him, and now he is an older minister of the gospel, John Mark is, and now Paul says of him, he is profitable to me for the ministry. Praise the Lord. In other words, he got better. <laughs> well, that's what we all want to do, is get better and more mature and grow up in the Lord. Now, why does the Bible even talk about this instance? Why even bring this up? 
there's a whole lot of things that happen that weren't recorded in the book of Acts. Amen? You know, it says of Jesus that if, if uh, everything that Jesus did in his earthly ministry was written down, the world itself could not contain the books. Well, I think the same thing is true of, of the Acts of the Apostles, that not everything was written down. But if this was written down, if the Holy Ghost chose to have men write this down under inspiration of the Holy Spirit and put it in the book of Acts, it's for a purpose. It's for a reason. It's for instruction to us. So we can learn a lot from this instance. We can learn a lot from this example. We need to put God first and watch that personal relationships, whether it is familial, as in your nephew, your cousin, your parents, that that doesn't interfere with your leading from the Lord and your direction and guidance from the Lord. Now, I know in my own life, as I was coming up in the Lord, the Lord dealt with me about a lot of things. He, one in, instance that I'm thinking about in particular is I had bought a car. I was young. I was in my 20s. I had bought a car, and that car, bless its heart, it just kept breaking down. I finally decided I'm going to take this thing in. It was a Toyota. I'm going to take this thing in the Toyota place. I'm going to have them go over at stem to stern. I'm going to have them fix it up and make it run right. I'd basically made a mistake buying it. And as I prayed about this, the Lord spoke to me and separately spoke to my wife and said, we need to give this car away and bless somebody with it after, after we've had it fixed up and running right, which we did. We put a lot of money into it to get it fixed. But then we decided to give it away. Well, my mom and dad thought, this boy has lost his mind. He's gone crazy. He's given away a car. Well, I ended up giving that car to a lady that was in ministry, music ministry and teaching ministry, out of our church at the time. And she did not have her own car, and she needed a way to be able to travel and go from church to church and minister the word. So we blessed her with it free and clear, gave it to her, and it ran like a top. She drove it for years in ministry. And it was a blessing to us. And we claim the hundredfold return on that gift. Hallelujah. We're believing for that to come in. Still, the hundredfold return on that gift. But here's the thing. My parents did not understand that. And they tried to talk me out of it. They fussed, and they said, oh, my, you lost your mind. <laughs> Poor boy. And, you know, I'm a 20-year-old young guy, both in the Lord and in the natural age you know, of the world. And so it, it was hard. But I'd heard from God. And so I had to put aside family relationship and obey the Holy Ghost. And it was a blessing. And we did not suffer from that at all. We went on, and God continued to bless us financially. And like I said, I'm still believing for that return. Amen. But the thing about it is, we followed after the Lord. And that's what we've got to do, is follow after the Lord when it comes to these things. Don't be moved by family relationships. Don't be moved by friend relationships. Your friend tried to tell you, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I've, I've had that happen before too. But you got to do what God instructs you to do. Amen? Even though it may chafe your friends or family sometimes. All right, we're out of time. We're going to have to go.